My name is Rebecca Cohen. I'm the director of BBYO's Women's Leadership Initiative. And I'm really excited to have all of you here, to have Rebecca Goldman and Lucy Steinman here, and several other really important guests as well. Uh, the Women's Leadership Initiative is something new-ish to BBYO. We're about a year in to the work that we've been doing to expand opportunities for both current BBGs and BBG alumna to grow in their leadership. Uh, we understand that uh, leadership looks quite different for BBGs, for Olives, um, and even more so looks different once we find Olives and BBGs entering the workforce. Um, so we know that BBGs are really strong leaders while they're in our program. They're holding the same number, if not more, leadership positions. They're raising their hands for the same number of opportunities. And we know that when women are entering the workforce or find themselves uh, well into their careers in the workforce, that we, we don't see the same opportunities as women holding the same number of positions or uh, higher up positions within the organizations. We don't see them uh, being offered the same opportunities always as their male colleagues. So we're trying to figure out uh, what that disparity is and uh, trying to do a lot of work within the Women's Leadership Initiative or WLI to um, make that right. So our speaker today, Rebecca Goldman and Lucy Steinman, who's going to interview her, are going to talk a little bit about that. Um, before that, I'm going to introduce you to someone really special to our WLI work as well, Diane Greenwald, and Diane will do some introductions of Rebecca and Lucy. Diane is a trained designer, communications professional, and art historian who ran the marketing department of a major architecture firm early in her career. And after returning to school to complete her coursework in museum education, she acted as a docent in New York City museums, focusing on sharing art with family and children, and ran an arts education program at her local elementary school for over a decade. Uh, now, as a parent to teens or uh, some in our program. Diane finds herself really fortunate to be a full-time philanthropist and volunteer, uh, supporting the communication needs for many local organizations. She serves on many different uh, organizations. She's a trustee for the Scarsdale Public Library, has done a lot of work to really champion their $20 million renovation. Uh, she serves on the League of Women Voters Board, the Scarsdale Foundation, many, many others. And she's currently serving as the inaugural uh, regional chair for our New York Women's Leadership Advisory Council uh, for BBYO. So I'm going to turn it over to Diane. I just want to give you one logistics before logistic before I do. Um, we're going to have you muted throughout the call. You do have um, the opportunity should there be a need to unmute yourself. However, we're really going to ask you to engage via the chat. So you should have a chat feature if it's not already open on your window. There is a little chat button at the bottom of your screen that you can click to open up the chat box. And should you have any questions for Lucy or for Rebecca as we're going, um, Diane will help to facilitate those throughout the call. So please just go ahead and write those into the chat. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you and turn it over to Diane Greenwald. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, everyone, for being on this call. Um, it's uh, exciting to uh, do this by Zoom. Um, you're here in my office, um, and I'm just checking to make sure that that door is closed because that's my bathroom door. And I just wanted to make sure that we are being professional um, in even this setting where we're all sort of at home and uh, hunkering down. So I'm really thrilled to be here to help introduce Rebecca and Lucy tonight. Um, I'm going to go off script for a second um, to thank the extraordinary BBYO staff who have helped put this event together. Um, Rachel Kruger, Dahlia Shapiro, Carly Zimmerman, and Rebecca Cohen, um, who have made this event happen and have been demonstrated extraordinary flexibility, energy, creativity, um, and support for one another. Um, which is what we in this initiative are celebrating and exploring together, is using Jewish values in support of um, other women professionals. Um, so it's really exciting to see um, the young women um, supporting the younger women um, and old women like me getting to um, participate and watch you all achieve and explore together. So 
Um, that was my off script. Um, now I get to tell you a little bit, um, Rebecca already told you a little bit about what we are here with the Women's Leadership Initiative. Um, this session is part of a series of events. It's the second one. The first one was last week. It was Jean Chatsky, the BBG alumna and frequent Today uh, host, or Today Show guest. Um, and she spoke on the topic of making money make sense. And so today, though, we're going to be talking, shifting gears, or tonight, we're shifting gears and we're talking about creating a movement of change. Um, I am so excited to be um, here with other members of our Women's Leadership Initiative Advisory Council. Um, some of you may already know that last year BBYO received a transformative gift from Ted Perlman to honor his mother, Anita M. Perlman, founder of BB uh, B'nai B'rith Girls. So um, all of this um, brings us all together in some exciting and interesting ways. Um, so tonight's uh, conversation will be between Rebecca Goldman and Lucy Steinman. Um, I'm thrilled to say that we're all connecting here on this platform. Sometimes we call this Jewish geography, but tonight I can also call it sort of Jewish genealogy because Rebecca Goldman is not only a woman that I admire, she's also my cousin. Um, and we married into the same family, and so we are chosen relatives. Um, and I'm thrilled to also add that Rebecca moved this fall around the corner. So even though we are visiting with one another through um, at our you know, social distance, um, we regularly get to see each other, even if it's six feet apart. Um, so Rebecca joined Time's Up when the organization was still just an idea and became its first employee. Rebecca oversees day-to-day -day operations and ensures that the organization is set to deliver on its global strategic goals over the short and long term, and she will surely be telling everybody what those goals are. She brings two decades of leadership um, into building innovative social impact organizations, and in uh, 2014 was named one of Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business, and that is so cool. Um, previously, Rebecca was the founding director of Good Robot, the social impact arm of Bad Robot Productions. Um, and she can maybe tell a little bit about what that is because those names are very intriguing. Um, she was executive director of the Kate McGrath and JJ Abrams Family Foundation. So um, Rebecca can talk more about her um, sort of what got her into social enterprise and the kind of work that she does today in support of women's stories and women's voices. Um, I'm going to introduce you also to our team today, who is Lucy Steinman. She is currently a junior at um, I don't know if everybody can see that um, Lucy's on one side of me and Rebecca's on the other. So um, Lucy is currently a junior at Dalton School in New York City. Um, she is a Saganit, did I say that right? Yes, I got that right. Um, of the Manhattan region, Lador Vador BBG, um, which means she's in charge of planning and running chapter programs. So someday you'll be running this, hopefully in person. Um, in addition to BBYO, Lucy is deeply involved in an organization called Days for Girls. It's a nonprofit that increases access to menstrual care and education for women and girls globally. Lucy serves as the New York Chair's social media intern. She's organized Days for Girls programs for her BBYO chapter, her school, and extracurricular clubs, um, which also is so impressive. Um, so now I'm going to turn this over. You, Lucy's going to interview Rebecca. And then we'll have some Q&A. And as the other Rebecca, Rebecca Cohen said, um, we, if you have questions as you're thinking and listening, please put them in the chat. And I hope I'll be able to navigate that and get some of those questions to them at the end. So Lucy, Rebecca, all up to you. Thank you. Um, so Rebecca, I know you're a Time's Up founding member. What exactly is Time's Up? Good question. Um, well, first, let me just thank you all for having me. I'm a big fan of BBYO um, for a long time, but then obviously have heard amazing things about this group from Diane. Um, and I know it's really incredible that you've started this and you're thinking about these issues and challenging this new generation to think about them. So thank you for having me. And I also want to shout out my niece, Miriam Goldell, who's here and watching from Potomac, Maryland, and um, excited that she can be part of this network. Um, 
So I'll tell you a little bit about how Time's Up started, um, which I think um, gives a lot of lessons to all of you as you're sort of in different moments of your life and thinking about um, how you can create change. Um, I think many of us sort of, all, probably most of you were aware in end of 2017 when um, a group of women in entertainment for the first time came forward against Harvey Weinstein um, thanks to incredible journalists giving voice to really decades of um, harassment and abuse. And from that one moment of what we call these silence breakers who sort of told their story, um, more and more women started coming forward and raising their hand and Alyssa Milano sort of sparked this Me Too hashtag that went viral um, that really had been something an incredible woman named Tawana Burke had begun a decade before. Um, and as this was happening, a group of women in Hollywood just started to meet. It was a few phone calls to a few people, and then 25 women came together in that, in October of 2017. And those 25 women sort of gathered a few other 25 women, and I was lucky enough to be part of those first conversations. Um, and soon, before we knew it, we had about 300 women in LA and New York, and then ultimately in London, all meeting. Um, and what was amazing about this moment was these were some of the most famous actresses, writers, directors, producers you can think of today. They had never all been in the same room together, right? So often it was the only woman cast in the movie or the only executive invited into the meeting. And there was such a feeling of isolation. And they came together in this community um, and felt sisterhood for the first time with other women. Um, and at first it was people sort of sharing their stories and sharing you know, their pain and their experiences, but very quickly they wanted to turn their pain into action. Um, and so we sort of started with a few things. One was um, as so many women were coming forward, what became really clear was that they didn't have access to legal resources to fight their case. So what the reason why this issue has been silenced for so long is because women who came forward were often threatened and retaliated against and would lose their jobs. So they had a choice of either staying quiet and not telling anyone what happened or getting fired, or they would have these secret settlements that sort of hushed the story. So the world didn't know what happened. You couldn't see sort of these patterns of predatory behavior. Um, and then there was sort of this culture that didn't really understand what this is and didn't believe women. Um, so we started what's called the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, which was a way to connect women and men who would come forward with their stories with access to legal support so they could understand first what are their rights and then if they decided to pursue legal action, um, they could defend themselves or they could, you know, pursue legal action or defend themselves if they were being sued for, for defamation. Um, and we had no idea that this was gonna be anything more than you know, a few women coming together. But when we launched in uh, sort of right before the Golden Globes and had this incredible moment where you know, the actresses turned the red carpet black, I think what happened was, it was we said it was like these tectonic plates shifting underneath us. Suddenly we started getting calls from women in industry after industry saying, this is happening to me too. And we wanna do something, we wanna to join together. And we realized that the opportunity ahead of us wasn't just to sort of correct the problem after the fact, right? Give people legal resources, but to actually um, address the root cause of what was going on. So harassment is a symptom of an imbalance of power, right? At the end of the day, um, people use this as a way of asserting their power. And if we wanted to change the system, we had to both make workplaces safe, but also make them equitable. And so to the conversation that Rebecca with Cohen was having in the beginning, you know, why aren't women sort of reaching the top? Um, it's not that they're not leaning in enough. It's that there's a whole series of systemic barriers that prevent women in the workplace from reaching their full potential. So those are things like the lack of pay equity. I'm sure many of you follow the US women's soccer team and their sort of you know, 
lawsuit to try and demand not only equal pay, but also the same kinds of practice fields, the same kind of, of transportation. Um, there far too often is a lack of affordable childcare that impacts women disproportionately. There's pregnancy discrimination that happens to women. Um, and then what we're talking a lot about, and I'm sure you're, you're hearing about in the news and we'll talk more about is the lack of paid leave that disproportionately impacts women who often are the caregivers to both children and to elderly. And so we wanted to come together to um, sort of join in this community of women, of you know, our male allies, of people of all gender identities to relentlessly call out the injustice that we were seeing um, around the world and in every industry to advocate for change across culture, companies, and laws, um, and to pioneer new solutions so that the world could be more equitable, hopefully for you all. Yeah, so now we've heard about this amazing movement that you're a part of. Um, and how you got involved. We'd love to hear more about you and what your inspirations are, um, especially like given the, the topic at hand. So I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. I was, went to a, a Temple Emanuel Synagogue um, and then went on to college at Dartmouth and um, graduate school at Columbia. Um, and I think for me, inspiration comes from two places. It comes from people and it comes from moments. And so, you know, big inspiration for me was um, my sister who, um, when I was still in college, decided to start a nonprofit organization with a few friends. And I remember literally the night where she came home to tell my parents, you know, she wasn't going to be a lawyer. She was going to start this, you know, crazy idea. And it was a napkin on our, on our kitchen table. And now it is an organization in 30 countries. And I had the privilege of helping her start it, but just seeing the way that she had this idea and she took a risk and charted her own path and that my parents allowed her to do that um, was really inspiring and sort of always helped me think about not just doing what feels like the right path, but what will be the best life experience. And I think, you know, in today's world, we don't know always what the next step is, but if we go for whatever experience is going to give us the most creativity, the most curiosity, um, it sort of ends up being the right decision. Um, and the second was actually a moment that happened to me in high school, I was thinking about. Um, I don't know, I was a sophomore in high school when um, a really powerful case of police brutality happened. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a man named Rodney King or heard that story. But um, when I was in high school, before the internet, before Facebook and YouTube, um, there was a moment where a man in LA filmed um, a black man who was brutally being beaten by a bunch of white police officers. And you could actually see this, like we all, the world could see it. It was very clear. He was on the ground, he was helpless and yet he was getting beaten and beaten. And then when the verdict came out, um, a jury of white uh, peers found the police officers not guilty. And it was, the first, it was such a profound moment for me of what truly felt like an injustice. And so um, I, don't, I can't remember how, but a group of friends started organizing um, and we ended up doing a walkout of our school in Newton, Massachusetts. Like nobody knew that we were doing this and it didn't really matter, but we walked out and we marched to the mayor's office and it just taught me the importance and the mayor met with us, which was actually pretty amazing at the time. Um, but it taught me how, you know, when you have to speak out when you see injustice and it does matter to be in solidarity with people, even if they live far from you and they don't look anything like you. Um, and it also taught me the power of organizing, which so sort of that moment of organizing a small group there and what we were able to do was the same thing that happened years later with Time's Up when a small group of people called each other, saw an injustice and decided to make change. 
Okay, so given all that amazing background information, I'd love to talk about and discuss what's happening in the world right now and how Time's Up is responding. Um, when world events like the coronavirus take center stage in the media, how does Time's Up make sure its message stands out? I think we'd like to hear about like the paid sick leave campaign and the current Harvey Weinstein conviction. Sure. Um, so these are like, unprecedented times. And I think what it is revealing is um, a, the economic injustice, the racial and gaps that we have in our country where we're seeing um, disproportionately certain groups suffering more than others. Um, so for us, you know, when I talked about those, pay, those barriers to, um, to women achieving success, one of them was paid leave, right? So in every country in the world, women are paid less than men and they do more unpaid labor in terms of the form of childcare and elder care. And the United States is one of two developed countries in the entire world that does not guarantee paid leave. There are 32 million workers who can't take a single sick day. And even more disproportionately, 50% of Latinas and 30% of Black women do not have a single day of paid sick leave. And at the same time in this moment, we're seeing how dependent we are on certain workers, right? Whether that's grocery workers, farm workers, and for sure healthcare workers. 80% of healthcare workers are women. And so if we don't use this opportunity to correct like these systemic problems in our country that are, we're seeing brought to light now, this is going to happen again and again. And so we called on Congress, you know, not just to pass paid leave now, but to pass it permanently. We've also been highlighting women on the front lines from healthcare workers to you know, grocery workers and others, um, because we believe in the power of storytelling. And we believe that if we show the stories of these women and how interconnected we are, um, hopefully it will help all of us as a society value their experience more and ultimately make sure they have the right protections. The Harvey Weinstein verdict feels like a very long time ago, but it was a really profound moment. As Diane knows, I was convinced he wasn't going he, to be found guilty. Like literally that day, I was like, it's not gonna happen. Um, it is really hard in our legal system to um, convict somebody of rape. So an amazing organization called RAIN um, has a statistic that says of a thousand rapes, 995 rapists will go free. So think about that, right? 995 out of a thousand. And it's because the way the system works where, first of all, so many women who are raped do not tell their story right away. They wait a period of time to sort of process and understand what happened. So there's not DNA evidence always. There's not corroborating witnesses. Um, and there's often statute of limitations that um, prevent people after a certain amount of time from pursuing justice. And I think the fact that these women who came forward against Harvey Weinstein, one of the most powerful sort of men in the country, that they got justice was really a sign to women everywhere that, you know, that the culture is changing, that you can come forward and you can be believed that your um, attacker can be held accountable. And that's a profound impact that um, I think, you know, will slowly shift the way that we view women when they, you know, come forward with their stories. Uh, thinking about other Jewish men who have been caught in criminal behavior, what does this mean kind of for the Jewish community and for you? So I don't think it is unique to the Jewish community. I think that there are just some very um, high profile stories that have come out. And we, of course, you know, go to the ones that, you know, notice the ones that are, are Jews. I think this is a, you know, this is a cultural problem. This is a systemic problem. This is a global problem. Um, one of the things that I think it's powerful about Judaism, though, is the, is the spirit of redemption. So we as a society, I think, have to figure out, not in the, case, the most extreme cases like a Harvey Weinstein, where it's obviously a criminal behavior and they should be in jail, 
but in sort of the spectrum of issues that women are finally giving voice to, um, what does redemption mean, right? When does somebody get to, um, you know, come back for lack of a better word? What do they have to do um, in those moments? And I think these are, this cultural reckoning that we're in, I think we can look to Jewish values to help guide and shape it in a powerful way. I think we all need to figure this out together um, because, um, you know, this is uncharted territory. I think nobody has experienced something like this before and we have to work together to find ways to create a new society with women and men sort of standing side by side. We always, you know, this isn't about not having men lead, it's just having an equal number of women. Definitely. Um, and speaking about uh, redemption and that Jewish value, how does Judaism or your Jewish values influence your perspective, both professionally and personally? Um, you know, there was somebody reminded me of two stories in Exodus recently um, that just make you realize how these are lessons that we sort of have to keep coming back to. You know, I know I went to Hebrew school and it's like the same story every time, but every time you read it, it's different. Um, so one was um, the story of Dina, right? Like um, she is, it's amazing that there is this story of a woman who is raped, but we never hear from her, right? We just hear about the, you know, from others telling the story about her rape and her brother's sort of actions. Um, she was, and um, you wonder what would it have been like if we had heard from her, right? Like, what would her voice have been? And I think that so much of what we're trying to do is give women voice for the first time to tell their own stories. Um, but it's striking, right, that, in, that she's never given a voice. And I think about that a lot. Um, and then the other story that's really relevant to, you know, the crisis that we're in is, is um, you know, the story of the midwives in Exodus who, um, you know, don't, follow Pharaoh's orders of killing the firstborn, right? And as a result, they let Moses live. And the bravery and courage that they showed in that moment is fairly similar to the healthcare workers we see today. Um, and so it just, it's, you know, as we're living through history, as we're living through these unprecedented moments, there's sort of this weird comfort in going back to our own narratives and to revisiting those stories and what are the lessons and what are the morals that we can take with it um, to guide us. Um, to me, is really powerful. So thinking about what's going on in the world right now and people kind of reaching out to help in these times, um, BBYO is a movement of over 30,000 Jewish teens, both boys and girls, like me, who care deeply about shaping and changing the world, not just in the future, but now. So how do we harness the power of youth to inspire and bring about change? What advice do you have for teens today? This is such an important question. Um, Abram Joshua Heschel has this quote that I'm sure many of you know, um, few are guilty, all are responsible. Have you guys heard that before? Um, so I am sure it is so frustrating as a youth today to look at the world that you're about, you know, inheriting from obviously this health crisis to um, issues of gun safety, to climate change, to women's rights. Um, you are not responsible for it, but we need you to help change it. And I think we need all of your creativity and insight and passion um, because what this virus in particular is showing us is we are all responsible for each other, right? We are all interconnected. And so as frustrating, frustrating as it is, um, we need you. We need your. We need you to help be the generation to help. You know, to help change things and to solve some of these problems, um, not only for each other but for future generations. That's definitely how I feel. Um, to me, it's really, really important to give back and do as much as we can. So, speaking from my perspective, for girls specifically, how do we maintain the confidence we have as young women and bring that into the workforce? It's a good question. I mean, 
it's first of all, it's not just on girls, right? It's on all of us. It's you know, Diane and I talked, it's on her boys too. Um, so I think that um, one is educating yourselves, empowering yourselves, knowing your rights, right? Know your right, know, know your rights around harassment and what it means and what is illegal. Know your rights around pay and what are people allowed to ask you and, and what are they not allowed, you know, or in the future, um, you know, paid leave and other things. It changes state by state. It's a really complicated system. So empower yourself with knowledge first and foremost. Be an advocate for others. And I'll say particularly for our, our women of color sisters who don't have the voices that um, white women have in the workplace. When if you are lucky enough to be in a meeting, make sure somebody else is too. Like I, we never, I would never walk into a meeting anymore as the only woman. It's not acceptable. Men shouldn't walk, shouldn't allow a meeting where there's only one woman or no women, which still happen. And then as a woman, I want to make sure there are other women, and particularly women of color, at the table. Um, and so I think, sort of empowering yourself and speaking out for others um, are two of the things that I have seen. Um, there is power in community and in forming this, you know, these friendships and this sisterhood and what you guys are creating here is amazing. And if you stay in touch with each other and you network with one another, you know, you will be advocates for each other. Um, and that's really inspiring. Lucy, will you share a little bit about Days for Girls? And I looked it up this morning. I didn't know about it, but it sounds like an amazing organization. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'd love to. Um, so Days for Girls is a nonprofit organization that provides sustainable, reusable feminine hygiene kits to women and girls across the globe. Um, and it's a really, really important organization uh, to me, one, because it addresses women's rights and empowering women. It really helps destigmatize menstruation across the globe. Um, and also because it's very environmentally friendly. Um, every kit is reusable and washable, so it's very accessible for people in communities where they don't have um, the best sanitation um, and that sort of thing. So that's one of the reasons it's so important to me. Um, I also, as I talked about earlier, I really love um, giving back to the community and doing what I can. And Days for Girls is both local, like within the U.S. Um, and global. Um, and it is such a, an amazing and inspiring organization. So I got involved because my mom and my sister are really involved. Um, and so they brought me to a Days for Girls event and I just like fell in love with the organization. Before this, I didn't really know much about um, menstrual poverty across the world. And because of Days for Girls, I have learned so, so much and it's so informative and fascinating and it's so crucial to help out. Um, and so one of the things I do is run the New York City chapter um, Instagram, and that's an amazing way to reach out to people, raise awareness, raise funds, gain donations, um, and just engage people with the content. And from that, people will come to the meetings and participate in the movement. Um, right now, currently during the crisis, we can't really meet to make these kits or distribute these kits because it's not safe, but we have kind of transitioned into making masks with materials that we have. So if anyone is interested in making masks, that's always an amazing opportunity um, given like the circumstances. And then also on the Instagram, I'm doing um, this thing where I'm taking submissions from people just like everyone here. Um, and posting them and it's basically people telling me what they've been doing during this quarantine to empower themselves and others and give back to the community and help out. So like a picture of you and your family and like what you've been doing. Um, and I think that's really important to reach out to people um, and just spread what everyone's doing to help inspire everyone across the globe. That's amazing. So great that you are doing that. And if you can come help with our Instagram when you finish this. We need I'd all of you. Yeah. So we're gonna open it up now. If you haven't had the opportunity already to type in a question, um, feel free to go ahead and write that in the chat now. And we'll have a, a couple minutes for either Lucy or Rebecca to answer questions. And Diana, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Um, so I don't see any questions coming up, but I actually have one, if that's okay. Um, 
So one of the things I was just listening to is Lucy talking about how she supports her organization to try and do fundraising and um, get donations. And I know that lots of the BBYO um, organizations are also always trying to come up with ideas to do fundraising for their chapters. So um, Rebecca, you talked a lot about your inspiration and your passions that drove you to help create Time's Up but I'd love you to maybe give some um, background and some uh, maybe it would be informative to some of the teens about the practicalities of what it means to make Time's Up work, like where you gain and gather resources that support the women's and women and the programs that you are um, platforming right now. Um, so, so media is an amazing tool, right? We use Instagram and Twitter and um, and LinkedIn and Facebook and now have text. You can text join to 30644 um, and you can go online and be on, you know, email newsletters. And I think all of that way that, you know, Lucy, you were talking about is how you engage people and how you make them feel connected to the work and the mission. Um, and for us, it's about joining. And then once you inspire people about the work and what you're doing and they see impact, you ask them to donate, right? And whether that's $5 or $10 or $15, like I think there's a huge amount of grassroots fundraising that um, matters. There are platforms like GoFundMe and CrowdRise that even as, as young people you can use to write, um, you know, CrowdRise lets you do birthday fundraisers and things like that. Um, and then for us, sort of similar to I think BBYO, the parent organization, right? There are foundations that we can apply to for grants. Um, and there are oftentimes corporations who want to partner with an organization or a brand to show that they believe in that, in that mission and that value. Um, so, you know, we are an interesting nonprofit. Like for me, social impact has been about needing all the tools in the toolkit to create change, right? So sometimes that sort of traditional nonprofits, what you call 501c3s, but another way that you can go about it is more political advocacy, political lobbying, sort of electoral work, which um, an arm of ours um, that's a 501c4 can do. So it's like there's sort of traditional nonprofit service organizations, and then there's more political arms um, for creating change because, you know, we need um, we need to change laws in our country and we need to change who's in power in our country in order to see the change that we want. Um, but I, today, I've also worked in businesses that have an arm committed to social impact or there are, you know, these philanthropic foundations. So there's so many different sort of places in this ecosystem. And then what I think we're seeing, particularly from, you know, millennials, I guess the generation or two above you guys, um, is that people value organizations that have a mission, that have social impact and that are committed to causes. Um, so when you do it authentically um, and you do good work, I think that the money, you know, the money can come. So it takes a lot of asking, it takes a lot of creativity, is not always easy. Some people have a better, you know, personality for it than others. I don't have to ask for money, luckily. Diane's very good at it, though. <laughs> um. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, it is hard to ask for money, but if you believe in something and you care about it, it makes it easier. Um, shifting gears, I have another important question. I think that, um, Rebecca, uh, you and I have actually on our long walks have talked about a little bit in terms of, um, again, coming back to the issue of supporting other women and also about women coming out um, and what it is to tell their stories. and. Um, so one question that's coming up is about how, what's the best way to approach either a boss or a teacher or an adult or another person in your universe um, if you have a story of abuse and, and what, are the, what are the recommendations for how to approach that so that you're supported and, and successfully? It's a really good question. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, no matter how old you are or where it happens to you. Um, and it's not always the best path to confront the person themselves. Like oftentimes what you wanna do is go to somebody 
whether it's a parent, whether it's a guidance counselor or principal or you know coach, um, to tell them what happened and to find out what the best pathway to create, you know, to sort of get the, the sort of action that you want is. Um, because these are hard things to talk about, even slight things, like sometimes it's confusing, it's hard, you don't really understand what happened, um, you have questions. And so, you know, I think a first step is going to somebody um, trusted in, in sort of whether it's the organization that you're part of um, or environment um, that you can that you can feel like will give you the right guidance and counsel. Um, there's no right answer to any of these situations. Like there are so many women who never choose to come forward with their story and that's their choice and that's a really important choice to make. We talk a lot about things being survivor centered. Right? Other people may want to pressure somebody to do something. It has, it's your life and it's your choice. And you have to make the right decision for you, um, whatever, whatever that is. But I think what we're seeing is more people understand this today. Um, they want to help. They understand that it's not women are making this up or exaggerating or you know, have a different agenda. Um, like less than 2% of cases uh, to typically are not accurate. Like, so that means 98% are, we should believe women, we should trust them, we should allow them to tell their stories. And then there should be a process that is fair and just to, to sort of get to the facts. Um, but I would say to women, you should, you know, go to somebody you trust in the organization who has sort of some authority um, to ask them the best way to go about this. I also think there's a big conversation around what we call bystanders, right? Like, and this is where a lot of boys come to play. Like, it is not always um, on the person themselves. Like, sometimes we all see something and it doesn't feel right and you know it's not right. And now is the time to speak up and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, is there something I can do? I didn't like how this happened. Um, so it's not just on the person that it impacted, right? But it's on all of us at large and we can all play a role, whether it's happening to us or whether we're a bystander. Um, but I do think if anyone, if there's a situation that, you know, made somebody uncomfortable, you wanna make sure, you know, if you're a, a child, you tell your parents and then, um, you know, you seek somebody, whether it's a guidance counselor or a principal or a nurse um, in your life that you can, um, that can help guide you. Um, Rebecca, thank you. Rebecca Cohen, do we still have time for, say, one more question? Yeah, I think let's, we can keep going. I think there's some really great questions in the chat box. Okay, good. Um, so, Rebecca, you just, Rebecca Goldman, you just um, touched on, a couple times you've touched on a little bit about um, some thoughts about um, welcoming men and boys into our um, conversation about equity and uh, power and safety. Um, and the question has been brought up is how do boys and men get involved? Um, Rebecca has two sons, um, a first grader and a third grader, and I have teen sons who often look after her first grade and third grader. Um, and we've had this conversation together before about how do we raise righteous men? Um, and so that question is coming up and I'm wondering from your perspective at Time's Up, how do we make it a safe space for men and women to work together in service to this mission? So, you know, we made the choice in the early days of Time's Up really just to create for safe spaces for women. Women needed to come together and we needed to have our own space to have these conversations. And I think that was really important because I'm sure as you'll you know, see through this process, there's different conversations, there's different, um, you know, different sort of ways that women are communicating with one another that haven't happened before. Um, I said, I think if somebody at one point, like, it used to be the feminism of I, you know, there's one slot, and I'm going to get there, and I'm going to do whatever I can. And now it's about the feminism of we, because we realize if we all don't, join forces and create change together, just one woman in that spot isn't gonna do anything. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, 95% of CEOs are men. We're not going to create change if men aren't part of the, 
the solution also. And if they don't recognize that, you know, actually the data shows that decisions are better decisions happen when you have diverse teams. That's been something that's proving you can't have the only the same kind of person tackling a problem, right? You want different points of view and people from different backgrounds. Um, and so I think we, you know, have been inspired by um, some men who don't, who believe that this is their problem too, right? That they have to make sure that any room that they walk into, there's different voices, that they're not just, you know, favoring or calling only on, you know, on men, but that they're giving voice to women, making space for women. Um, and I, um, I think everybody welcomes it. I really do. I think that there haven't been enough, um, you know, men always interested in, in gender issues and hopefully that's changing and, and people are realizing, you know, this is about all of us and it's not just doing it because you have a daughter or, you know, a sister, it's doing it because it's the right thing for the world and going to make what, you know, your life better. Um, so I don't have the perfect answer yet because we're figuring it out, but I can say that, um, you know, we need men um, joining with us to create you know, this better future. So um, I think that was our last question. Um, there's a few more fabulous questions out there. Um, one of which is um, really about how to start these kinds of dialogues. And oh, I think a really um, like how to do this in your schools for teens. And I think that Lucy offered us a tremendous model for taking on um, an issue that might, some people, I mean, certainly when I was your age, Lucy, I would have considered an embarrassing thing to talk about. So I think that, um, that you've created a really beautiful model for other teens to tackle um, projects um, in interesting ways by coordinating maybe with other people and in service to other people. And Rebecca, I'm just um, thrilled with all the answers that you've provided us um, about the work that you're doing on the front lines of gender equity and um, about uh, personal safety and about power dynamics that we all want to impact. Um, I've, I've learned so much from both of you tonight. So I really want to say thank you and I hope we can revisit these topics again with both of you at the table to continue to answer more questions. Thank you all and Lucy, congratulations on all that you're doing. It's really exciting to see um, you know, the kind of leadership that you're taking. And I know that so many others, you know, on this, in this conversation are doing similar things and just want to thank um, the team at BBYO for, you know, having this conversation and recognizing that we need to, we need to start thinking about these issues now so that we can empower this, you know, the next workforce and the new generation of women. So thank you. Um, I'd love to thank everyone for listening to us and also to thank you for all the work you've done and like help pave the pathways for women to open up um, about things like gender. Thank you. Well, thank you to both, to really all three, Rebecca, to Lucy, to Diane, and everyone on this call for joining us. As Diane mentioned at the beginning, this has really been the second in a series of opportunities we're opening up to the greater community. So if you'd like to tune in to another one uh, next week, uh, I should say next Monday, we're hosting April 6th, a how to negotiate pay rate salary benefits, uh, even in this time of crisis. Um, so I'm putting that information in the chat and I will give you the link to register for that session. If you would like to attend as well, it'll be actually be led by one of our WLI fellows. Uh, so we hope to see you there and thank you all again for coming tonight and look forward to engaging with you hopefully in person down the line but certainly before then if you'd like to join us again for another BYO on demand session we'd love to see you there so thank you all and have a great night